Welcome to 10 Frames Per Second, a podcast about photojournalism with photojournalists for everyone. With your hosts, J.M. Giordano and Elena Volkova. Filling in for Elena Volkova today is Audrey Gatewood. Today's guest is Staff Sergeant Kenneth Halston, the National Press Photographer Association's 2015 Military Photographer of the Year. Welcome to 10 Frames Per Second. Uh, with our uh, guest today is Staff Sergeant Kenny Holston of the United States Air Force. Thank you for your service, first of all. No, thank first you for foremost, your support. Who uh, came up here from Fort Meade to talk about uh, being a photographer in the military. Uh, we're going to kick it off with a little bit of uh, photo news. It uh, looks like uh, the, the photographer Nick Ut, the AP photographer, who took the famous uh, quote-unquote napalm girl uh, photograph, uh, has finally retired. And before the podcast, I was talking a little bit with Kenny about being a lifer, a photographer, and he's going to be a photographer until he retires from the Air Force. So do you have any thoughts on on, on Nick's career? I mean, being long and distinguished, and especially with, with that being a, a somewhat military photograph of uh, something we were involved in in, in Vietnam. I mean, do, do you have any thoughts on, on how like that photo changed history or... You know, has it has photos like that had any effect on the way that the military handles pictures or access? Uh, absolutely, yeah. No, I think uh, you know N- Nick's career has been uh, you know vast, as you mentioned, and um, he's done amazing work. The particular you know famous photograph, the, the one that he's most known for, the Napalm Girl, um, you know, speaks a lot to uh, how important it is that photographers both in uniform and out of uniform be on the front lines in combat to show the rest of the world exactly what's going on. Um, More importantly, you know, I think that he didn't just exploit this young lady, you know, after he made that frame, he helped her, you know, he made sure to get her to uh, a hospital to where she could get help. And, uh, you know, because of that, she was able to survive. And I think that speaks a lot to uh, Nick's character and, uh, you know, I got to meet him when I was at Eddie Adams uh, uh, one year, uh, t- t- 2013, and uh, he talked to me a little bit about that photograph and things like that and, you know, the fact that he was able to help her afterwards. And I just thought that that was uh, really, really, a really important right. piece to go with that photograph. Right. And her, her name her name is uh, is uh, Fan Thi Kim Phuc, and she's still alive, and, and her and Nick are friends. I wanted to put a name just kind of derogatory to keep saying napalm girl when she does have a name um, i mean she's actually an anti-war activist there's a lot of uh mm-hmm. she she goes travels around and, and speaks about her experiences and things like that and of course eddie adams had that other photograph of um of the 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 south vietnamese sergeant um shooting the guy in the in the head um which is kind of interesting that you went to meet nick at, at the <laughs> eddie adams workshop so but anyway eddie i mean uh, nick it was a good run so from this podcast we thank you for your service in ap um let's get on with the show so can you want to tell us a little bit about how you got into photography being in the military sure yeah um so i uh i graduated high school and everything and i didn't uh necessarily want to go to college right away but my parents were like hey you need to do something with your life so i joined the military and I simply got lucky uh, to be a photojournalist. You know, I had the uh, you know high enough uh, ASVAB scores, like a military test that you kind of take or whatever to be placed. It's like the SATs for the military. Yeah, and so um, they placed me. Uh, they said you're going to be a you know a basic fil- basic still photographer was the uh, original job, and then uh, throughout my career they merged both uh, journalism and photography. So now we're photojournalist and we also do public affairs duties as well so great and kenny real quick um where are you from i'm from san antonio texas uh where uh air force basic training is actually held so like while i was in basic training like i could look outside the gates and uh you know long to be home (laughs) even more and how long have you been the air force i've been in for just over 11 years so they had like Pina coladas and things. At air. At full, <laughs> full disclosure: I'm a U.S. Army vet, uh, so I'm gonna I'm gonna be ribbing Kenny just a little bit when I get a chance. 
So do you want to maybe talk a little bit about the school that you went through? Like what was the training for, uh, for photojournalism in the military? Sure. So um, we go through uh, what's called the Defense Information School, DENFOS, at Fort Meade Army Post in Maryland. And um, it's a pretty intense uh, training because they have to cram a lot into a very short amount of time, uh, like four to six months is the training. And um, after you're done with that training, you're expected to go to your duty location and be able to, you know, perform uh, your photojournalism duties at, at some of the highest levels. So um, it's a it, it's an intense training. The instructors there are also military for the most part. Um, they're more senior ranking uh, individuals mm -hmm. who have been in the career field for quite a while and then they eventually got called back to the schoolhouse to teach the craft to those coming in to the military. I just I just had this image, sorry, of, of these of like military photojournalists instead of using M sixteens, you're all in the prone position, like <laughs> shooting shooting down range, right? You know, people be screaming at you that three hundred millimeter Aaron, what the hell are you <laughs> Right, yeah, yeah. All, it's all it's that exact thing. Um you know, at Fort Meade going through uh, technical training school to be a photojournalist, you do see all these. Do they? Uh, do, do they really? I mean, no, no joke. Do they really put you through combat situations? Yeah, I mean, yeah. We go through uh, uh, what's FTX, like field training exercises uh -huh. and stuff like that, while you're in tech school to simulate, uh, you know, combat situations, uh, field, uh, field conditions, and stuff like that. And you're expected to perform your photojournalism duties in that con in that condition. Well, I might re up. Wow. You know. <laughs> I wish I'd have known that going in. Wouldn't right. been, I wouldn't have been an MP. <laughs> right. Um, so do you feel that photographing your experience in the Air Force sort of changed your perspective of your time there differently than had you not been taking pictures? Yeah, um, it's it's like a front row seat to a lot of things I wouldn't have gotten to see or experience otherwise. So if I, would, if I had done any other job in the Air Force, um, I wouldn't have had access to a lot of the things that I've seen and experienced, both good and bad. Um, so it definitely gives me a wider perspective, uh, kind of a overall perspective of all the different duties that an uh, airman would perform. So do you, I mean, do they, um, like with, with the training, do they, do they talk about censorship at all? I mean, do they, are they straight up, like some of the things that you photograph won't be made public or anything like that is there any kind of training for that kind of stuff yeah absolutely so um both in tech school like i was talking about earlier and when you get to your first base you learn all about uh classified and unclassified uh you know material things that you may photograph uh could be classified um for nu numerous reasons um other things are classified for a short period of time and then eventually unclassified and are able to be released um, and the reason for classified information is is simply for whatever uh, campaign, you know, the Department of Defense might have going on. It, it could be detrimental to release something uh, for for the service members who are serving mm -hmm. in a certain area and stuff like that uh, or for their family members. Or it could just give away, you know, the U.S.'s position on something. So that's the reason it's not hiding anything. Mm -hmm. It's um, it's more of strategic, uh, you know, operating Right, so you don't have too much say then as an editor, um, as a military photographer. Right, yeah, we're um, so we rely on our PAOs for that. PAOs, public affairs officer. Oh. So I'm an enlisted member, and I work tandem with a public affairs officer. So he or she will send me out to, um, you know, uh, uh, write about or photograph, you know, whatever it is, something going on, and then I'll bring that material back, and we'll sit down and go through it together. And he or she will decide, um, you know, what we're going to release and when. And like I said, and all that's based on the type of mission that we're, we're covering. So. so do you do you look at each situation, like whether it's a, a general, what they call a grip and grin <clears throat> or field operations photos? Do you look at it with the same artistic kind of eye? Because you do. The photographs are fantastic, by the way. Your Flickr page, which we'll put at the end of the put at the end of the podcast. Uh, is great, and I noticed like the photos of the heroin, like, the heroin users in Baltimore. Um, but then you you have to go to these like mundane PX openings and things. Um, that's the post exchange um, openings. Do you do you ha do you use the same eye that you you would put into with these other projects? Like I know a lot of photographers uh, that I some that I work with. If they don't like something, you can tell they don't like it. 
Like they, they don't they don't put the same effort they put into in a, a project that they like. Do you where do you fall in, into that, especially with this kind of stuff? Uh, so yeah, you, you're right. You hit the nail on the head. I mean, it is very <clears throat> challenging uh, sometimes. Whenever uh, photographing, like you said, a ribbon cutting or the base exchange being open for the first time, but I try to approach every um, you know every event or story with uh, you know a, a unique perspective. All of them are equally important. You know, we wouldn't photograph uh, something if it's not you know, if it wasn't important. Mm -hmm. um, so whether I think it's more mundane or not, I try to put my maximum effort into it and then use those photographs to, you know, show the public, both internal and external audiences, uh, what exactly is going on with our military and where our tax dollars are going. Right, so how do you bring the skills that you learned in your military training to different photo projects, like your series on, um heroin use, for instance? Uh, absolutely. So, you know, covering uh, Al, um, he was a homeless heroin addict in Syracuse, New York. And um, w w when covering, when, you know, when I was embedded with him, uh, it was over, you know, over 10 months that I, I tracked that story and I, you know, spent time with him uh, out in Syracuse. Who was that and, story for? Can you give us just a little bit about how sure. you went from a jet to yeah, Syracuse absolutely. for 10 months? Yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. So um, we at Syracuse University has a uh, kind of a deal with the Department of Defense to let uh, all service members um, who are photojournalists uh, be a part of an advanced uh, journalism program there for a year at the university. And what you do while you're there as as a military member, you take all the classes that are required to be taken in person on campus uh, to then later be able to matriculate. And matriculate is, uh, you know, take classes online to then finish your, you know, bachelor's degree in photojournalism. But, you know, in order to do that, you have to take some classes uh, there on campus. So we do that over a year long period. It's a very, very rigorous program, really hard for us to get into. You have to submit portfolio and, and write, you know, this reasoning of why you should get to go there and things like that. And so your uh, respective services will then place you um, two to three uh, photojournalists from each service get placed there each year to study photojournalism and then come back to the Air Force and use what they learned at Syracuse University uh, to to, you know, uh, do their photojournalism job in the Air Force. So all that said, uh, while I was there, one of the stories that I was covering uh, was um, the opioid addiction that has, uh, you know, really taken over there in Syracuse and frankly across the nation. And Alan Sanford, uh, the fellow that I that I was embedded with, you know, who was a heroin addict, um, <clears throat> was uh, uh, one of this, you know, one of the stories that I covered uh, in conjunction with the opioid uh, problem there. Okay, so I, I mean to sidetrack Audrey's question. No, I, no, I, just, I, I, I was really curious, that. yeah, about the 10 month uh, thing. So what was your, you, you wanted to Oh, yeah, yeah. So going question. back to my question was, how do you take the skills or, yeah, how did you take the skills that you learn in service and apply it to a totally different context sure so um outside of just the technical skills you know how to use your camera and all that stuff um i was able to bring a um i guess a different type of awareness when i was with uh you know alan sanford in some of the neighborhoods and things that we we're in whenever he was going to cop heroin like get heroin and stuff like that um you know there was some uh tough tough situations that, that we were in just out of uh, just because of the areas that we we're in, things like that. And, you know, the military teaches us uh, awareness and how to uh, not only watch our own back, but watch out for others and things like that. So I was able to um, apply that skill set, uh, you know, whenever we were, whenever I was embedded with him and stuff like that. So really uh, knowing how to keep myself safe and, and frankly, keep whoever I'm around safe while, uh, you know, still doing good photojournalism. Uh, I'd say that was the biggest, uh, and was it, was it, okay. So those photos, did you have to run those by anybody at, on post or I did? Yeah. So, um, because it was, uh, because it was, I was in, you know, Syrac I was attending Syracuse university 
for the military and things like that. Um, that's where the military connection comes in as far as the stories that I was covering. And before I could do anything, you know, with those photographs, because I, you know, work on behalf of the Air Force, I ha I sent I actually sent them up to uh, some of our leadership at the Pentagon. And, um, you know, they they knew the program that I was in and stuff like that. And they reviewed those photographs and then, you know, told me that I was able to re release, you know, release them and stuff like that. So. so can you publish anywhere? Like if AP wants those photos, I mean, do they are they still property of the military? Yeah. So if AP wanted those photos, they could um, now that they're released, they would actually they could actually pull them down and, and use them for free. Um, they could publish them. Uh, Roy, you know, Reuters, AP, um, any any wire service uh, and any 24 hour news cycle, CNN, you know, mm -hmm. stuff like that can once uh, we release these photographs as a m military photojournalist, then it's um, free use for for anybody. Interesting. Did you? Oh, you, you look like you were ready to ask a question, Audrey. That's why. I was, no, no, I'm just in awe here. I, was, I don't know a lot of this. Yeah. So, um, so another question that I, I had is, is: How many photos do you have that you can't show anybody that are like, oh, like, sorry, <laughs> that are like these are these are awesome, but I can't show? Does that happen a lot? Where you sit down with? I mean, is there any pushback with, between you and your editors on on post about like you have a great photo that you just can't? put out there sure yeah um there, there's a lot of us uh military photojournalists especially those assigned to like the first combat camera squadron down in uh charleston south carolina you know you get sent on assignment to cover some com uh, com uh complex combat situations and um some of that stuff uh simply can't be released you know right away and uh so i do have quite a few um images and, and stuff that uh you know the the world might never see um and and that and the reason for it like i said is um for certain operations and things that the military has going on uh you know we don't want to give away any positions or or put our military members uh in uh harm's way so but how does it make you feel as a photographer like since you're kind of you're in service but you're also an artist so how does that make you feel as a photographer that's uh, challenging you know it's challenging um and so the one thing we have to remember as photojournalists you know be, as a military photojournalist is that it's it's service first you know it's duty first and the only reason we're taking these photographs is to you know advance the mission and get the mission done so um a lot of times my my art and you know the desire to um you know, full, show the world uh, this or that might have to take a back seat to the mission, and uh, you know, it's it's really it's all about getting the mission done uh, for us. Um, how do you feel your fellow airmen view you as a military photographer? Are you seen as like an asset or sort of a distraction or? Um yeah, what do they think? Sure. Um, so a lot of times, uh, you know, as, like I said, as a military photojournalist, it, it really depends on how you conduct yourself, especially when you're embedding with a unit. Um, they might initially view you uh, as a little bit of a burden, like, oh, here comes the camera guy. You know, we got to keep him safe and all this stuff. And he carries, you know, cameras instead of guns or something like this. But um, once you... Uh, you know, prove to them and show them that you're, you know, you're just as trained and uh, mission oriented as they are. And you're there for the same reason that they're there. And the photographs that you produce uh, will provide intel and things like that for, you know, the commanders to be able to make decisions to further advance the mission. Mm -hmm. Then they realize that you are very much an asset and, and fully capable of, embedding and, and getting the mission done with them, you know, along, alongside them. So ultimately, like overall, I think even in combat, even in combat. Yeah. Um, and that's where, you know, um, all it is when, when you embed is, uh, sometimes the unit that you might embed with might not have a vast understanding of photojournalists and what they do for the military. And so it's your job once you embed to, uh, not just tell them, but show them how you're an asset and things like that. And once that occurs, then, you know, they're, they're happy to have you alongside them, you know, in whatever situation. So, is. so what point in, in a combat situation? Well, I mean, I guess air force, I'm not, I'm not being snarky, but I mean, I guess air force is much on the ground. Uh, uh, well, service, you, you, but I mean, do, do you 
have you have you have you had to make the choice between rifle and uh and camera yeah i have i have and so and and going back to the you know what you're saying like air force not being on the ground so much i mean uh, people do primarily think of us as flyers and stuff like that which we do have that mission and it's a vast one but uh more often than not uh you know uh combat photojournalist in the air force is on the ground uh we embed you know all my deployments i've embedded with the army and the marines and we were on the front lines you know no kidding outside the wire um, walking around Afghanistan, uh, you know, finding weapons caches and collecting them and uh, rolling up, you know, uh, uh, Taliban and, you know, opposition uh, forces and stuff like that. And um, so it's uh, it can get pretty complex. And uh, yeah, I've been in situations where I had to make the decision to use my camera or, you know, my rifle. And you just hope when you are in those situations that you make the right choice. Mm -hmm. Well, piggyback on that, Audrey, do you want to, about this, about the stigma, sorry. Um, is, is there, is there a, 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 okay, so when you're in photojournalist mode and you encounter like AP guys, is there a stigma um, that's attached to you being a military photojournalist as opposed to a, you know, a civilian photojournalist when, when you're in these like combat situations, knowing there's other, you know, wire guys, wire people uh, around you? Yeah, uh, well, I think what, uh, other military members like about having a uniformed photojournalist with them as they do know that we uh, have, you know, a combat skill set. And they just hide behind you. <laughs> <laughs> You're a good shield for photojournalists. <laughs> right, right, right. No, um, so we, you know, we're able to not only use our cameras and stuff like that, but we're able to protect ourselves as well and others in our unit. Whereas, uh, you know, maybe the AP guy or, or Reuters uh, person might not have that same training, um, you know. Um, so that's I think that's the biggest difference. Not only that, but you know, I have a as a military photojournalist, I have a front row seat to a lot of things that uh, a wire service photojournalist or or twenty four hour news cycle journalist uh, might not have uh, access to. Right, but you a lot of your stuff won't be shown though. It's possible. I mean, it is possible that some of it won't be shown, um, at least not right away. That right. is, you know, that's always a possibility. But it's the most important thing is that it's documented initially, mm -hmm. and uh, has the potential to then eventually be released. So, in a in a, Audrey, do you want to you want to feel free to just jump in because I'm make this the Joe show. <laughs> no, no, I'm just I'm listening. I'm listening. Um, I do have a question, sort of about the future of your work, um, which is, it, it just sounds to me like your intuition and the quickness that you must be able to think and visualize um, is very fine tuned from all of your training. And I can't see any sort of um, facet that that wouldn't be helpful in. I feel that you could apply yourself to sort of any subject matter really, really successfully um, to Thanks. photograph it. So I'm wondering um, if you have any visions for the future of what you want to do with your work. Are you still in the Air Force? Um, yeah, what's next for you? Sure. So, um, you know, for, like I said, I've been in just over 11 years. So um, once I hit that 20 year mark, I'd be able to, you know, retire from the Air Force. And uh, so that's the plan for now. And then after, you know, the Air Force, my, my passion really lies in uh, uh, photojournalism uh, in the sense of like wire service journalism, like we were talking about earlier. So I'd love to continue to uh, cover complex issues uh, around the world um, and, and, you know, show the world what's going on in whatever area via, you know, my How, how my old will you be when you retire? Uh, I should be right, like, Right around 38, 39. Okay. Yeah. So you did you enlist right out of high school? Right this? out of high school. Oh, okay. Yeah. So yeah, this is so he's called a lifer. He's not gonna go. Mm -hmm. He's not really gonna go anywhere. Yeah. So I'm I'm gonna get back to the combat thing because I'm more like a dog with like a chew toy. So <laughs> <laughs> um I, I, I did want to get I did want to get a little serious for a moment because um not a lot of people know this, but uh, during the Vietnam War, um the the now kind of infamous photos of the, the My Lai massacre uh, were taken by an army photographer. There was actually no, I don't think there was any civilian photographers there because the photos came out later when he, had, I think he'd already out processed and had the films. He was a civilian. Um, his name was Ron, um, um, 
I, I think it's Haberl, H A E B E R L E, so Ron Haberl. Um, a very, very famous case. How do you think you would respond as a military photographer if you were in the same situation and saw something that may be against your ethics or your humanity? Um, yeah, I, I, I'm, I, yeah, how would you respond to that? I'll let you go. Sure. Yeah. Um, so again, it's a, it's another, uh, very tough situation to be in. Um, you know, in the air force, we have our core values and, you know, one of them is integrity first. And so if it was a question, you know, of wrong or, or right, um, if something was going on that was not right and was against our, you know, our code and our ethics and things like that, our military values, then it would be my job to voice that to, you know, my chain of command, you know, my higher ups and let them know what's going on. As far as being in the situation on the ground as something's occurring, you know, if I'm there to photograph what's going on, I'm going to make those pictures, you know, I'm going to photograph it. Uh, it's just a matter of where those photographs will go later. And, and really a lot of that would be out of my hands. You know, it's my job, like I said earlier, to turn over those pictures to a public affairs officer. And then she would work tandem with a commander to decide which way uh, that, you know, that particular situation would go. Do you think now with more scrutiny on the military, it's more difficult for, um, and I, I think, I think with the Mylai case, it was more of a rogue command you know, it wasn't indicative of everything going on at the time, um, although there were some cases. But do you think now with the the Internet and social media and, and the spotlight that, that these kind of things are, are, you know, I mean, actually, even even Abu Ghraib, which uh, army <laughs> again, unfortunately, um, you know, that and that was a that was also a military. Well, that was a that was an amateur military photographer, I think, that 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 those those photos leak. But that was someone in service that leaked those photos. But do you think it's becoming more difficult for those incidents to occur with social media and the more scrutiny on the military? Sure. Yeah. I mean, social media presents a whole different beast. Um, anybody. So now you don't it's not just the military photojournalist with the camera, but, you know, anybody in any unit with a cell phone could, could make pictures and, and send them out to the world. And again, I you know, I would kind of point back to our military you know, standards, our ethics, and uh, the fact that, you know, each service has um, its own core values, uh, one of which being, you know, one of which is integrity. And that's why, you know, service members, uh, you know, often refrain from doing anything like that, leaking pictures or taking photographs of things that they maybe should know that they're not qualified to photograph and things like that. You know, we, we have a mission to do and, you know, all, all any service member, wants is to advance that mission and by doing something like that you know leaking images that shouldn't shouldn't be put out or could compromise a mission uh is detrimental to our overall goal so nobody you know no service member uh usually would would do something like that mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. audrey uh just real quick do you or would you have any advice for someone who it was in your place when you were first starting fresh out of high school, um, wanting to be a military photographer. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. So if you want to be, you know, a military photographer, and you're just out of high school, whenever you go sit down with, uh, your recruiter for whichever service, army, Marines, Navy, <laughs> air force, it doesn't matter. Like <laughs> let them know that up front. Hey, I want to be a photojournalist. A lot of people don't realize that it's an, it's a job in, in each mm -hmm. service that it's like, it's a thing. Um, so if you let your recruiter know that, um, though the job is, um, it's very small in each service, it's hard to get into. There are slots, and if you already have that skill set or it's something that you're vastly interested in, uh, I would make it known to your recruiter and, and let them know that you won't accept anything else uh, <laughs> except that job and, and, and work with them to try and get that job in the military. And yeah. was, it, um, was it much different than how you thought it was going to be going into it? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I didn't realize... Um, the access that we would have as, you know, photojournalists, mm -hmm. um, you know, I kind of mentioned it earlier, being able to see, uh, and experience so much, uh, just because I am the guy with the camera and whatever is going on needs to be, 
uh, documented, you know, photographed and, and things like that. So I think that was the biggest difference for me. I, I, I think initially I thought I was going to be stuck, you know, taking the photos of the, uh, the ribbon cuttings and the gripping grins, but that's not the case at all. Yeah. Sorry about the, the, my, my laugh earlier, because when I went to my recruiter, I tried that <laughs> and I was told you're not Dan effing rather pick another <laughs> MOS. Um, and my ASVO scores are pretty high. So I got military police because they, they had originally offered petroleum specialists. And I was like, it's a gas pumper. I'm not taking petroleum specialists. But I, I asked about the Army School of Journalism and they basically laughed at me. This is just towards the end of Desert Storm. So he was like, yeah, you're not Dan effing rather. Let's pick another MOS for you. So he got he got a good ride through the Air Force. Maybe you have to go to an Air Force recruiter and not uh, not an Army recruiter. Right. Say, yeah. <laughs> yeah. To quote Full Metal Jacket, you think you are Mickey effing Spillane. You know? Right, right, yeah, yeah. So no. ha- actually, I, I, I didn't think about this, but have you seen Full Metal Jacket? I have, yeah. So how how is um how is the role of military journalists portrayed in that movie as it is in real life? Um, I you know I I think they did a good job with it. Again, I mean it is a movie, but um, we you know, the way they depict a military photojournalist is pretty accurate. You know, we sit down with a an editor uh, or a PAO, like I was mentioning earlier. We talk about the stories that are out there that you know we need to cover and um talk about you know everything that's going on both in the combat zone and and here stateside and stuff like that and then we go out and we you know do our very best to cover it and sometimes we are conflicted you know just like uh just like uh goodness what's what's joker yeah just like joker was you know as far as you know, he has the, the peace symbol on his vest, but is he... That's like, a kind of sick joke. <laughs> right, yeah, exactly. Yeah, you know, that whole thing and all that stuff. But um, ultimately, like I said, when you are in the situations, uh, regardless of what you're covering, the first thing you have to remember is your job is to help advance the mission. So uh, whether you're conflicted or not, if your views don't line up with the views of your commander and things like that, then you're out of line. So, hmm. Audrey, you want to jump in? I, I was gonna, I was going to ask um, about the gender breakdown of of um, military journalists. Is it is it is it mostly male, or do you see a lot of women coming into or identify as women coming into the profession? As in the past, I mean, it's been obviously more of a a man thing. Quotes air quotes. Um, but yeah, do do you see um, many cadets coming out? that are that are women uh yeah absolutely uh, a lot you know a lot of uh a lot of our military photojournalists um and public affairs officers are um female and um i uh, during my time in service you know i've seen it be a, a solid mix of both male and female which um provides a, a more vast uh perspective when it comes to storytelling you know when i work with my female counterparts they uh, are sometimes able to look at things uh, from a whole different perspective than I might view them uh, strictly based on their experiences as a female, you know, throughout their life. Mm-hmm. And uh, uh, I think we each make, you know, each other better. Uh, yeah, how are they, how are they treated in combat zones? Um, <clears throat> as far, uh, you know, as far as a, just speaking on, uh, for military, female military photojournalists, um, I, I think that, uh, you know, their, the treatment has been, um, good. I don't, I've never, I've never seen any maltreatment or anything like that. I'm not saying that it doesn't exist. Um, again, of course I'm not a female, so I can't, uh, speak uh, directly. No, we'll get one on the podcast. On <laughs> yeah. Might, yeah. Absolutely. Next, I've got a, that yeah, I've got a, I've got a couple of good ones for, you know, a really amazing female photo journalist, military photo journalist is Jody Martinez, who currently works at Scott air force base in Illinois and um, she was nearly the military photographer of the year a few years ago. Uh, I think she placed like second or something like that. And, you know, her work, she's she's served in, you know, numerous complex situations and mm-hmm. things like that. And her, her work is breathtaking. And, uh, she, you know, when I was speaking about providing different perspective and stuff like that based on being female, she's uh, somebody who I look to for that different perspective and, and things like that. She's an amazing photojournalist. And- so so we, we had found your work through the National Press Photographer Association, which I'm a member, disclosure. Um, I got their, their magazine and I saw that you, congratulations, you were, uh, did we mention at the beginning, 2016? No, we didn't, 2015. 2015, 2015, that's right, because 2016 hasn't happened yet. So 2015 Military Photographer of the Year, which we should have put at the very beginning, which I think when we redo the intro, right. we'll, we'll put that in the intro. <laughs> 
Yeah, it's, no it's, problem. Well, but they seem to have changed the rules this year. I don't know if you saw that. Do you know what? Do you know what prompted that? Do you what? I mean, do you have any insider information? Or just give us a little bit. We only have a few more minutes left, so just give us a little bit of background on why that why that changed. Sure. Um, it was. Uh, there's there's several reasons, you know, uh, why it changed. Things evolve in the military all the time, and um, to try and better programs and things like that. Uh, it had a little bit to do with the, you know, set of pictures that I submitted for Military Photographer of the Year. Um, people, some folks felt like. Um, it, which, which which photos were they? Uh, the the uh, Baltimore, you know, the my Uprising. stuff that yep, the Baltimore riots and um, you know the heroin addict and stuff like that. Um, while it did have a military tie and everything else, um, there was some folks that felt like it wasn't strictly you know military service members in the pictures, and so they wanted to kind of guide the contest in more of a direction of uh, depicting actual service members in the photograph, regardless of you know, even if you're photographing something that does have a like direct military tie, which my photos did, you know, the national guard was called out for the Baltimore right. deal right. and things like that. I was in a military program when I was covering the heroin addict and stuff like that. So right. all my pictures were legitimate and vetted. They were all vetted. You know, I was told that I was allowed to use these pictures and things like that. But, um, uh, as the contest goes forward, they wanted to kind of drive it more in a direction of, of, uh, depicting actual service members doing, you know, military operations. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I, I, I can't say that I disagree. I think that uh, it's a good direction that the cool. program is going in. And, uh, you know, we, we can only play by the rules that are that were given, and that's what I did. Yeah, and, and, and real quick, just before we get into our flash round of, of questions, because um, I'm getting this side-eye from the producers and the, the text. Um, so we have to talk about your gear. Just really quick. What do you shoot with and, and why? And is it good in combat situations? Sure. Yeah. So um, it's really awesome being a military photojournalist in the Air Force. Uh, Nikon backs us. And cool. so, Nikon. yeah, I, I love Nikon. Um, I shoot with their flagship cameras. Uh, Nikon. Currently, I shoot Nikon D4 and D5. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I'm a pretty simple guy. I like a 17 to 35, uh, you know, lens for my short focal length and a 70 to 200 uh, for the you know, longer focal length and, um, you know, maybe a, a fixed 50 for portraits and stuff like that from time to time. And any apps, any photo apps that you, do, I mean, do you do, in, do Instagram? Yeah, yeah, I, I have uh, I have Instagram. It's Kenny, Hol Kenny underscore Holston. Um, now, is that uh, vetted also? Uh, yeah, so I, the military photographs that I do post on my Instagram are images that have been released by the military. So everything that I post, somebody else has already taken a look at and like, yeah, you could use it for whatever you want. The world can see it um, type of deal. And what about drones? Are you training any drone? I mean, <laughs> I know we, we have drones in the military, very, very big drones. Um, do you, do you train on the, on the civilian, on the photo, the photo drones? Yeah, I, I don't specifically, um, I, I stick with the, with the DSLRs, but, uh, we do have, you know, like, uh, uh, uh Andrew Breeze who works mm -hmm. for us at air magazine, you know, he, uh, he is drone trained and stuff like that. He's able to fly drones, uh, to gather imagery and, and video and things like that. So there are folks, uh, in the military that, uh, have that skill do, set. Do you shoot yeah. video? Do you do, I do. do combat situations or? Yeah, yeah. So I do both stills and video um, and, and print journalism as well. Um, so my, uh, I would say what I'm best at is is stills. That's that's where my passion lies and things like that. But I think that there's, uh, you know, each of the mediums are tools to, you know, storytelling. So whenever I feel like, you know, maybe a picture isn't mm -hmm. the best way to get the job done. I, I rely on video and uh, written uh, means of communication. Yeah. Are, are you allowed personal projects? Yeah. Um, I, I So as far as my personal projects go, um, I am trying to con continue to contribute to uh, the opioid addiction awareness uh, as well as HIV awareness. Um so a lot of my personal projects are based around those two. And are campaigns. they vetted? Are your personal projects vetted as your? No, not there? at all. So when I'm operating in a personal capacity, um, the stipulation is I can't use my military issued gear. So I actually have. Ah, so what do you shoot with when you're not? I was wondering. About yeah. That. Uh, so I, I still stick with Nikon because uh, that's, uh, that's just what I love. Um, so I have my own uh, Nikon D4 and Nikon D800 
with a, an array of lenses. Oh, I thought you were gonna be like, I have a cool pick because you know, yeah, I get paid that much <laughs> military salary. Is yeah, allow for a Nikon D five. Yeah, no, I yeah, I basically uh, you know I um, like don't eat, so I could be able to afford right, there gear. We go. You know, yeah. I've uh, got the paycheck, so I know right. I know where you're coming from. Yeah, yeah, it's expensive, but yeah, so that's what I shoot with on on my personal time. I use my own personal equipment and stuff like that, and uh, and in those situations, I'm allowed to. Uh, inject my personal opinion and view and stuff like that Interesting. And, I, and I don't have to be vetted are there any time. projects you want us to kind of guide listeners to to look at on your on your Flickr? um yeah, i would just say uh just visiting my Flickr page is it would be amazing um they don't you know there's no specific project you know like i said i am you know my uh two big campaigns are, are you know hiv awareness and, and opioid addiction across our nation um so there's definitely imagery uh, on my Flickr page, on my Instagram and stuff that uh, kind of speak to that. But um, most importantly, I'd love for people to, you know, just take a look at uh, my military work specifically and uh, just to get an idea of what our service members do uh, each day, day in and day out, and uh, just continue to support our, our services. Um, you know, and, and so, so as an MP, we had a motto, don't confuse your rank with my authority. So I'm going to order you as an MP to get a website. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> All you know, we're going to like, I'm like, a flick your page. I'm like, come on, man. It's like having a hotmail. Come yeah, on, man. I agree. Yeah, no, um, I'm actually, I'm actually working with some folks at Air Magazine. Uh, we're working, we're currently working on my website, my personal website, um, uh, offline. So they're, they're trying to help me get that. Together. I'm not as tech savvy as I should be. So they're trying to help me get that together. Cool. Well, you want to take us into Sweet. our rapid, yeah, uh, I know, um, rapid fire round? Yeah, I know we really picked your brain, <laughs> Kenny, already. But if you have a little more juice left, we do have, um, we ask our guests three sort of rapid fire questions where if you could just sort of fill in the blank um, for your answer. You ready? So photography is primary, primarily a tool for uh, storytelling. When I look at an image, I look for emotion. And a photographer is responsible for uh, telling the truth and uh, you know just putting imagery out to the world that, that depicts the truth. Great, thank you. Um, In blank army, blank navy. No, I'm just, I'm just joking. I'm just, I'm just joking. And we do right. have no. We we we're, we wrap it up with. Um, are you reading anything? We have a little like a arm. What we call the armchair photojournalist. We usually discuss what we're reading. Are you? Um, what's on your bedside table? Um, <laughs> or tablet? Sorry. Sure. Um, right now, um, I like to follow the other services magazines. So all hands is is usually what I'm looking at. Um, they any do, books? Anything you're? Uh, not. I don't. There's not any uh, current books that you know that I'm reading right now. Um, it's I'm a I'm a magazine type of guy, um, newspaper type of guy. Um, that's where a lot of our you know photojournalism uh goes not militarily wise but just photojournalism uh, in general so um definitely you know so our our other services magazines and then um I'm always looking at you know New York Times Washington Post and stuff like that so that's the that's the literature that that lays uh, by my bed you know in the evenings so Audrey what are you up to Oh no! Because the, 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 the host, what I'm, the what host I'm is supposed to uh, fill to one in. Nothing. It doesn't matter. I'm I'm reading things that aren't that I think are tied into photography that aren't. Um, it's completely unrelated. I'm reading yeah. a book about astrology. Oh, nice. cool. Um, yeah, about um, how to how to analyze a star chart. <laughs> no, that's that's great. I mean, that's yeah. It doesn't have to be about photos. I mean, I'm reading um, George Orwell's uh, Road to Wigan Pier, which is about coal miners in the north of England. And I'm I'm formulating some things about doing some stuff locally with what industries are left in in Baltimore based on that. And I wanted to throw a recommendation, which we'll put up, is um, a book called Shooting War. It's Photography and the American Experience in Combat by Susan Moeller, which you won't be able to put down. I guarantee it. It's it's, it's probably the best book written about um, combat, and it goes from the Crimean War up to the Vietnam War. It's dated. It's 89 is when it came out. So mm. it really didn't get into the, the conflicts in, in Central America, which I wish, but it's, it's very well written. And it's, it's really good. Like you won't be able to put and it down. And it's called so. Shooting War? Yeah, it's called Shooting War. It's by uh, Susan D. Muller. You can like get it on Amazon for like a buck. That's great. Right. cover. Yeah. I, awesome. I don't think it's available on Kindle or the tablets because it's kind of older and a little more obscure. But um, definitely, definitely pick that up, man. It's really, really good stuff. Well, thanks for, for being sure. on the podcast. Yeah, absolutely. If I could, I'd love to give a shout out to some other fellow military photojournalists that are doing really great work. Sure. Um, 
There's a Jensen Stidham. Uh, you guys should check out his work. Just Google him. Russ Scalf, Larry Reed, uh, I mentioned earlier, Jody Martinez. And then uh, he's retired now, but JT Locke uh, okay. does really good work. Uh, Demotz is, is another one. So um, those are just some, just a few of many uh, really awesome military photojournalists. Uh, Abe McNatt is, is another and great just one. Real, real quick, and then we'll, we'll wrap, I promise. Um, so are, are there any are there any photographers that you, we didn't actually ask about ones that you look up to, just real quick. Are there any that come to mind that, that you looked at in your budding career as a photojournalist? Yeah, I mean, as I, as I was rising through the ranks, as far as military photographers go, is definitely Chip Morey. Um, I mentioned Larry Reed. He, he's been a big mentor of mine. Um, Vernon Young, uh, another a, a big mentor of mine. We're, we're kind of peers now, but he was uh, leaped out way ahead of us. Any you civilians know. jump out um, of like so, Yeah, civilians. Uh, Blake Sell, um, he, he worked for Reuters, AP, and stuff like that. Um, of course, Nick Oot, who you mentioned, uh, Eddie Adams, um, you know, there's there's several that I, you know, um, looked at Eli Reed and and some of these, you know, uh, John White, amazing uh, photojournalists. Um, and, and then on top of that, you know, I love Anderson Cooper. I know he's more of a celebrity now than anything, but, you know, where he got his start was right there on the ground, uh, you know, in, in the thick of things. In the Vanderbilt um, mansion? Oh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Did I say that? Did I say he was a Vanderbilt? <laughs> he was a Vanderbilt. But, you know, he doesn't. He never... <laughs> He never uh, really, he never really relied on that. I think, uh, you know, if you read his book and stuff like that, he really built himself yeah. from the ground up, and uh, he didn't rely on, all. He didn't always rely on the money and things like that. You know, he d he definitely has a passion for for journalism, and I, I think that it shows. He's so. in a Diane Arbus photograph as an infant. Did you know that? Sure. I'll pull it up. Yeah, we'll put that what? on the. I'll put a link to it <laughs> since you mentioned it, if it makes the cut. Yeah. Put a link in there. All right. Well, thanks a lot. Absolutely. Sasser, I thank really you appreciate it, and thank you for your service again. Oh, thank you for your Be support. safe out there, man. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you, thank Kenny you. Holston, everyone. <laughs> This has been 10 Frames Per Second, produced by Audrey Gatewood and John DeVecca at the WLOY Studios at Loyola University, Maryland.